Hi, my name is Dr. Chir Patel. I'm a full-time sleep medicine physician that's board certified and fellowship trained. And we're going to talk about what sleep apnea is, which is a very common topic. First off, snoring is probably the most common indicator that a person may have underlying sleep apnea. Snoring is the sound of vibrations of relaxed soft tissue when you're breathing. And in essence, when we look at this little model here, the area that I'm referring to is predominantly straight back here in terms of what we loosely call the back of your throat, which would be just straight back behind the base of the tongue and the chin. So snoring, like I said, all it is is when you go to sleep, because of muscle relaxation of your tongue, muscles that hold the jaw and the neck and the gravity, everything just relaxes. As you're breathing and air is passing through your mouth and nose, if there's extra soft tissue back here, it'll vibrate and that generates the sound of snoring. But that extra soft tissue could also be disrupting airflow, which is what sleep apnea is. Snoring itself has been determined to be the most common finding in people diagnosed with sleep apnea over the last 30 years. Any individual that snores to any degree, whether it's soft, intermittent, or loud, constant, there's a three out of four chance that he or she may have sleep apnea. And it turns out, as of data from January 2019, it turns out one in three Americans actually have underlying sleep apnea, and the most common finding is snoring. So if you snore or you know anyone that does snore, they really should be tested for sleep apnea. Now, what is sleep apnea? So sleep apnea, there's many different kinds, but the most common form of sleep apnea, which is associated with snoring, it's called obstructive sleep apnea. That's where there's literally a physical obstruction that's preventing you from breathing when you're sleeping. So we'll refer again to our model. So when you go to sleep, because of muscle relaxation, the back of your throat here may completely collapse or close off. That's when a person may wake up gasping or choking or feel like they couldn't breathe or their spouses or bed partners said, hey, you stop breathing, or more often, sleep apnea may just be episodes of partial collapse, which you may not feel and your bed partner may not notice, but it can still result in the same long-term issue. Immediately, what can happen is you can get a drop in oxygen level, which in turn can trigger the release of adrenaline, which can stress your cardiovascular system. But then because the brain is also monitoring your breathing when you're sleeping, if it detects that you haven't taken a full breath because of an increase in carbon dioxide because you couldn't exhale completely, that disrupts sleep. So that's how sleep apnea would affect quality of sleep. In terms of risk factors for having sleep apnea, we thought for many years that weight was the largest risk factor for a person having sleep apnea, but it turns out we've realized as more and more patients have been diagnosed with a condition, the largest risk factor for any of us having sleep apnea actually turns out to be the throat structure or how wide or narrow is the back of your throat. Weight is a modifiable risk factor, meaning as we gain weight, the neck may get larger, so that could cause a little bit more weight for collapse and increase the frequency at which the throat collapses. But genetically, it's the throat itself that's the largest factor. Now, in terms of data, so it was published in the last three to four years that close to 45% of people with moderate to severe sleep apnea are not overweight. So that again supports that the largest risk factor for any of us having it is how wide or narrow is the back of your throat. What are the negative implications of not treating sleep apnea? So it turns out more data has been published in the last five to 10 years indicating that sleep apnea actually is a very serious condition. It's much more so than simply snoring and bothering your bed partner or not sleeping well or feeling tired during the day. It turns out because of the repetitive drops in oxygen, untreated sleep apnea alone can increase a person's risk of developing atrial fibrillation by two to three times can increase the risk of heart attack by three times and even stroke by four times. Up to 70% of patients with atrial fibrillation, which is a very common irregular heart rhythm, actually have underlying sleep apnea. Up to 75% of patients that have had a stroke of any sort, whether a mini stroke or a TIA or a full blown major stroke, actually have sleep apnea as well. It also turns out that untreated apnea can increase a person's risk of developing obesity, type two diabetes, hypertension, even elevated cholesterol levels. And more recently, in the last few years, we've learned that untreated apnea has turned out to be a major cause of dementia. But then also in August 2017, it was presented that untreated apnea is a major cause of Alzheimer's disease. And having untreated apnea alone can increase a person's future risk of Alzheimer's by up to five times. So snoring is a big deal, and as is sleep apnea. So if you snore, you should be tested for sleep apnea. What are the common treatments for sleep apnea? So the most commonly used treatment for sleep apnea since 1981 has been the CPAP, or the mask as many individuals refer to it. 
It's not oxygen, it's not a breathing machine, it's not forcing air into you. The device itself is basically a vacuum and a compressor and a humidifier. So the unit takes air from the room, it filters it, and it pressurizes it and humidifies it. So as you're breathing with it at night, what it does, it just helps to support this region of your throat open. So that gets rid of snoring if it's set correctly, but then it allows you to take full breaths in, so now you're not having drops in oxygen and you're able to fully release your carbon dioxide so that in turn now prevents the brain from having to wake you up to get you to breathe so that's how it improves quality of sleep other treatment options there is a mouth appliance that dentists have been making for a better part of 30 years or so what it's designed to do is it's designed to get you to sleep with the lower jaw this area here thrusted forward so it's trying to physically keep this part open but the limiting factor of those devices are that you can only hold a person's jaw forward only up to a certain point because you're limited by your own jaw joint. So according to the literature, they're about 50 to 60% effective in mild to moderate cases of apnea and less than 25 to 30% effective in severe. But then there's also potential risk of causing teeth shifting or bite changes or even TMJ issues as well. Uh, surgery was being done for many years by ear, nose, and throat surgeons because they thought for many years that if we could widen the throat, that could potentially cure sleep apnea and snoring. So f there were about 25 different surgeries that were being performed over the course of about 30 years. But in 2010, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine upgraded their surgical treatment option recommendations that do not perform because the issue is is that the throat is very prone to scarring so whatever tissue they would remove whether it was a section of the base of the tongue the uvula or even soft tissue back here it was getting replaced by scar tissue and scar tissue has a tendency to contract so for most individuals snoring returned and the sleep apnea either temporarily went away or it got worse or it came back so unfortunately, surgery is not recommended any longer. The newest treatment option that's on the market from 2014 is a device that's called Inspire. It's a pacemaker type device that they install a pacemaker in the right upper chest, and then they attach an electrode to the nerve that controls the tongue. And what it's designed to do is that if it, design, if it detects that your tongue's falling backwards, they'll send a short little electrical impulse to, in essence, activate the tongue to move it forward. So it's trying to basically move the tongue forward to open up the back of your throat here. But as you can imagine, you can only give so much of an electrical shock to the tongue, otherwise it's gonna hurt, so they're not 100% effective. The most effective treatment option still since 81 has been the CPAP device. It's nearly 100% effective as long as a person uses it, it's set correctly, and a patient tolerates it.